All right, guys. Um, Nate Mahan here, head football coach, Hamilton High School, Big Blue, um, just north of Cincinnati, Ohio. Want to first off thanks uh, thank to thank you to uh, Coach Banstra for having me. Um, he reached out to me a couple weeks ago, and and pretty excited to uh, to talk some football and 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 grow the game a little bit during this uh, weird time. So uh, I'm excited to be here, and um, you know, hopefully, you get something out of this, and uh, you know, we go from there. Uh, my, my contact information is listed. Um, if you want to email me, follow me on Twitter, um, Coach's Choice website as well, but. Be more than happy to help in any way, especially during these times. It's uh, good to get some football out there. So at any rate, I want to talk to you about uh, what we're doing at Hamilton High School. Uh, we are in the Greater Miami Conference, in my opinion, uh, the best uh, public school conference in the state of Ohio. And I'm going to talk a little bit about keys to a successful football program, as well as some fun things and simple offensive run game concepts that I like to do. So we're going to talk about two, two of those things, those two themes today, and i uh, excited. So thanks for joining me. Again, shout out to Coach Banstra for what he's doing on YouTube. And uh, if I can help in any way, let's get it going. So thanks, guys. Uh, just real quick, I chose the topics. Um, I love talking scheme, and we'd love to sit here and talk scheme all the time. But I do think it's important to understand um, you know, what are your resources as a head football coach and uh, at your particular high school and, and what things are working well and what things aren't. But um, these things I'm going to share with you guys are things that have worked at three different schools. So uh, there's probably some, some good stuff in there at some point, but uh, yeah, I think they've, uh, they've lasted through a couple of different schools and uh, get some, some things that again have worked really well and we've carried with us and I've carried with me, me through a three school stop that I've been. So real quick, Again, I'm the head coach of Hamilton High School. Current, um, I'm a proud alum, so good to be back at uh, the Hamilton Big Blue. Uh, we did qualify for the playoffs this past year for the first time in nine seasons in the first year, so that was pretty awesome. Uh, Little Miami, I was there for three years and uh, made our first playoff appearance in 27 years and actually won a playoff game against a very, very good Edgewood football program. So uh, that was pretty awesome. And then came from Cincinnati Northwest High School, uh, which is uh, uh, in the same school district as Colerain. And we won our only playoff win in school history there for about 50 years. And we had back-to-back -back playoff appearances in 2013 and 2014. So now the reason I bring that up is just to, to again, the, some of the concepts and some of the fun things I want to share with you. I just want to make make sure that, uh, you know, that they, that they have worked and they're not just crazy ideas. But, again, three different programs all qualified for the Ohio uh, State Playoffs, which is pretty neat. So, um, also, before I go any further, I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, to my guys at Hamilton, my staff and uh, staff members, and my guys at Little Miami and staff and guys at Northwest as well. So um, had some good success at each place, and if it were for some great coaches and some great players that bought in, wouldn't be able to talk about them as much and, and, and brag on them a little bit. So thanks, guys. All right, so, you know, what I think uh, keys to a successful program, I, I, there's about three things that I want to talk about, but uh, the first thing being hiring just a great staff, but more importantly, uh, hiring a staff where everyone has a role. Um, I think it's important to define those roles and that uh, th there may be some overlap, but uh, when you define everyone's role, I think everyone can succeed in that role and, and, and really be autonomous as much as they can to be successful. So so when I say everyone plays a role, there's uh, two things that I've kind of thought about over time that have, have really worked. Um, if you're at a smaller school, talk about the rule of three. So I think it's really important to have three guys at a minimum uh, that are just there all the time, but also no scheme and no football and, uh, again, are just – all in all the time, um, kind of the head coach. So head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator type situation. You got to have at least three. Um, sometimes if you have more than that, that might be too much at a smaller school. But if you have less than that, that's probably not enough uh, for obvious reasons. Um, if you're at a bigger school, I think it's important to have a rule of five. So you're talking about the head coach, uh, two studs on offense, two studs on defense that, again, that are really all in and uh, are really doing everything that the head coach is doing and, and, really five guys, four plus one that you can count on. So um, 
you know, the three times I've hired new staffs, I've really, really thought long and hard about who are those main five guys, who are those main three guys that uh, you can count on all the time. And then everyone else plays roles from there. So uh, I think it's important to think about that and get the guys you need and get the guys you want. Number one, uh, coming into a, a football program, trying to make it successful is hiring great people. The freshmen practice together with the JV and varsity. So I've always done that. And I thought it's been very good for us and just the, the, the development of, uh, of your freshman team because in a couple of years from then, they're going to be your guys. They're going to be your JV varsity guys. So I do like to have the freshmen practice together at Hamilton. We still practice together. You know, we're pushing upwards of 90 to 100 guys, but uh, the freshmen practice together. Uh, we practice on the game field right next to the high school. And I think it gives them a, a reason to do it. You know, it keeps it exciting for those guys. The freshman coaches have roles on the varsity staff. They are treated as uh, high school program coaches. You know, I think it's important to label your freshman coaches as high school program coaches and treat them as such. Um, you know, last year at, at Hamilton High School, our head freshman coach worked a lot with the running backs and, and ran the running back individual. Um, again, same at Little Miami, our, our, our head freshman coach was the freshman running, uh, excuse me, our head freshman coach was the varsity running backs coach and helped run varsity individual for the running backs. But it gives them uh, gives them all, some autonomy and gives them a purpose as well. And uh, it helps me keep an eye on things as well. So um, all coaches are, are high school program coaches. And last thing, all coaches have on-field roles and off-field roles. So I think it's important when you're uh, when you're looking at your staff, what are those things that you can count on people to do on the field? That's easy. You know, you got a running backs coach, you got a wide receivers coach, inside backers, outside backers, et cetera. But, you know, we have a peanut butter and jelly bar where we're constantly feeding our kids. Well, who's loading up the peanut butter and jelly bar? That's got to be defined. Who's taking attendance every day? Uh, that's a big thing in Hamilton, but it's been a big thing everywhere I've been. Are you taking attendance every day? If you're not, you should. Uh, you got to keep track of those guys, and then you have to define who's who's keeping the attendance every day. Is that going to fall on the head coach? You're going to give that role to somebody else, but it's important to define that role. A great opportunity for other guys to, again, have off the field roles that are very much important um, and also not drive the head coach nuts, I guess, too. So um, there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, for example, um, who's in charge of your, uh, your huddle. We, uh, we do film every practice at Hamilton. So someone has to, someone has to literally film, uh, film the, film the practice and I typically uh, will grab an iPad or a phone to film the tight copy and, and we will uh, weave those two together for every practice. So we're getting the utmost film, but again, that, that could be somebody's role, give them a job to do and make sure it's important. So, uh, th so those things to think about when you're hiring a staff, are you hiring a staff full of 10 offensive coordinators uh, that hasn't worked out well, you know, so make sure everybody has a role and everybody shares those roles. Uh, at the bottom here, other characteristics, Characteristics of a good coaching staff. Yeah, I like to be a balanced, uh, younger and older, less experience, more experience, and again, defining those roles as much as possible. Uh, I think it's kind of fun to have uh, a couple of uh, ex ex head coaches, uh, maybe guys that are looking to bounce back into uh, being a head coach, or some guys that that don't want to do that anymore. But um, you know, not not knowing everything all the time it's really cool to bounce ideas off of some, uh, some guys that have been around the block before. So I would, uh, I would recommend that uh, value everyone's time and try to be as efficient as possible. I think that's important when you set a calendar and set your schedule that, uh, that you're taking care of everyone's time and making it important. So we'll appreciate that. And then the last thing, your staff should always reflect the players on your team. Uh, I think it's important to make sure that you take a look at your team and your staff reflects what you have. I think that's very important. It'll go a long way. So again, number one, successful football program. I think you got to hire great people with defined roles. Next thing I think that we've been, uh, been able to do is, is really emphasizing making football fun year round. So in the season, football's great. Football's fun. Everybody loves it. But are, are you evaluating how much fun is it in the off season? Uh, that's important to a good program that's that's becoming year-round as we know it in high school football now. That's more of a year-round deal. And if you're not finding ways to make it fun, you may lose kids. So when you're making a schedule, uh, don't change it. Keep it efficient. Again, like we talked about, you're not wasting the time of the kids, the families, and the coaches. So uh, what I mean there is if, you know, if you're setting a schedule and, and you're saying Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're lifting weights and it's 3 to 4.15. Is it 3 to 4.15 every time or – 
sometimes you go over by 30 minutes. I mean, I would, I would uh, challenge you to stay right at 4.15. I would challenge you to uh, stay at your time because I think it's important and it sets a good example. Summer schedule. So we will have uh, built-in off-season breaks in our summer schedule. So typically we'll go Monday through Thursday, again, 9 a.m. to about 11.15 and again, our, our kids get picked up at 10, uh, 11, 15. So they're out of there at 11, 15. So it's important to keep that time. But also we will have multiple off weeks built into our schedule year round. So some of those are right after the season, there's a mandatory break, right? But we will be off during spring break. We'll be off the last week of school for exams. And then we'll, we'll be off the 4th of, 4th of July week. And then we'll also take a, a quick break right before mandatory football camp. And practice begins and again i think it's important to be there when you're there you work your tail off but when you're not there um, and you have an opportunity to let kids be kids i think they come back that much stronger so having some built-in uh, defined off weeks throughout your football calendar is just a great idea and i think it keeps everyone fresh keeps everybody interested and then when you are there you're working your tail off but again it's important to have some perspective and let kids be kids uh and maybe be home as well from time to time and take vacations if needed. So uh, that's just how we've done it and uh, really taken care of everyone's um, uh, time and free time in mind. The last thing we do, we love an overnight camp. We've done it the last three years. Uh, it really gives you a chance to uh, build camaraderie. We take their phones away. They hate it. Uh, but again, uh, teaching them the value of teamwork and, and making relationships with each other, really becoming a cohesive unit when you get a chance to do an overnight team camp. So, I would encourage you to do that or try that as well. All right, just continuing on with trying to make football fun and the ways that we've done it. Uh, we've done a fourth quarter accountability Olympics um, at each school. It's, it's really been neat. So what that is, uh, I got this from my time at University of Cincinnati, but basically you're, you're splitting up the rising seniors and the coaches on your team into typically six different teams of, anywhere from 10 to 12 to 15. But the way it works is the seniors will, I'll appoint the seniors to the teams and try to distribute them as evenly as possible. They will then uh, draft their coaches to their respective teams. They will also, excuse me, <clears throat> they will also draft their underclassmen. So we have a draft, we have a mock draft, we'll make a big deal out of it. Um, we basically get into the war room and they, they decide who they want on their team. Uh, based upon accountability. So we hold members of the team accountable for attendance, any type of football production and engagement throughout the fourth quarter. So they know that going into it and they will draft the kids accordingly. So you may have a running back that's obviously a great player, but he jacks around when he needs to, when he doesn't need to in school, right? So uh, he probably wouldn't be one of the top kids drafted if he's an underclassman. Um, whereas if you got a kid that's maybe not a starter at uh, right tackle, but he does everything the right way, great grades, et cetera, et cetera, well, you may want to draft him in the first round of your accountability Olympics. So it's really bringing everybody together. It really puts the accountability in the hands of the seniors. I'm sure some people out there, some programs do something similar to this, but uh, this has been gold everywhere we've been. So I would encourage you to think about it, do it, and if I can help you set it up, uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. But if you check the bottom of the screen there, just a quick version of the point system and, and how that works. So we have a separate football field house facility. So every day that we have a football workout, let's say we're lifting Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, the kids get out there. I set a time. So if they're, by, if they're there by three fifteen, um, they get one point for being in attendance that day for the workout. So it gives you a chance to make them be accountable for being on time as well. Um, in addition, we have an academic bullpen, which is like a study table basically, but, uh, so if kids show up on time, but they've had rough grades, however, we may say if it's a D, if it's an F, they don't lose points. Uh, instead, they'll go to the academic bullpen, which is basically study table. And if you have perfect attendance and no academic problems for the week, you get four points for your team. So the only way you lose points then is out of school suspension or in school suspension. So really you're taking the fourth quarter, which as we know is the most important because our uh, eligibility is determined off a of fourth quarter in Ohio. But you're, you're really putting an onus on kids behaving, uh, kids buying in, forget ability, throw all the football ability out the window, but can you be accountable in the classroom? Can you stay out of trouble? Can you get good grades? And can you simply show up to workouts on time? 
And if you can do that, you're important to the team. And I think kids understanding that and, and, and you making sure that's that's a big deal, not just who can run the ball the best or who's the best blocker or tackler, but can you do something individually that can help this team, regardless of your football capabilities? And that's important, and I think you'll get more kids out because of that. So, again, uh, the fourth quarter accountability Olympics is an awesome deal that we've done. The next thing that we uh, – that we emphasize, we have an annual spring uh, top dog max out competition. So uh, shout out to my guys in Cleveland Heights. Um, got this from these guys. Uh, this is a great idea about five years ago that has been really, really good for us as well. So everybody's familiar with a traditional max out. This is like that, but a little different. So at the end of the school year, as a culmination of the off season, uh, we will have, again, what we call the top dog max out competition. So it's not your traditional max out, but it's a full-fledged competition. Uh, there's 10 events typically spread over three days, balancing both big boy events and skilled position events. So it gives the opportunity for, let's say your left tackle is really, really good. Well, we're not just doing all speed and agility stuff. That's built in, but we're doing maybe some uh, uh, 10 rep maxes or push-up contests, whatever it may be, uh, kettlebell swings, uh, med ball toss, whatever it may be. And then obviously skill position events as well. So um, that way all the big boys don't win. You know, we will do some form of shuttle run, 100 yard dash, 300 yard shuttle, whatever it may be. But all 10 of those events basically go into a system to where the top 10 finishers each get points. And then the top 10 overall get recognized. And the cool thing is the top three overall get awards at the fall banquet. So basically it's our, we're saying it's our kickoff. Uh, to the summer. It's our kickoff to the season. Um, the last so many years, the uh, the top three winners of the top dog have gotten big helmet plaques with their name and their place on it, which again, uh, they get at the fall banquet, which is really, really cool. But it shows everybody else how important it is to, uh, to do really well in the top dog max out competition. And it's just a little bit different from your, your traditional max outs. Again, this is a competition on the field, uh, on the track, and maybe in the weight room a little bit too. I know last year we pushed uh, pushed a car for distance over time, so we try to keep it as fun as possible. We usually let the kids dress up, and uh, maybe their 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 favorite uh, WWF wrestler or whatever. We've done that in the past. So again, we're making it fun and trying to find ways to. Uh, again, we're getting them to work out. We're getting them to try to run faster, but we're rewarding those guys as well too. So the top dog competition is pretty awesome. A couple points of note, uh, what do we tell our kids? Uh, somebody may ask, well, what do the freshmen do if they're, they're probably not going to win the, the top dog competition? Well, we tell our young guys and freshmen, uh, the goal is to try to finish in the top 10 for an event or a couple events and really compete. Uh, even if you're not recognized as one of the top three winners, we want you to compete and you're competing against your, uh, your teammates, but the coaches are taking notice as well. Returning players, we tell them to finish in the top 10 overall for points. That'd be a big, big deal. So, again, if you got a, uh, a freshman that's going to be a sophomore or a sophomore that's going to be a junior vying for some time, he could really turn the eyes of the coaches if he finishes in the top 10 overall for points. And then if you think you're an all-league guy or if you think you're a leader on the team, well, you need to be in the, uh, in the mix in the top three overall for points. So that gives you an idea of kind of what our expectations are. But we do let rising freshmen all the way through to rising seniors compete in the top dog. Uh, next point, uh, the role of the head coach and, and then making defense and special teams a priority. So um, I, I do think it's important to talk about how I see my role as a head coach. And then any successful football program, I really think that they're going to make defense and make special teams a priority at all times. So we try to focus on that. We try to make that important. Um, and that starts with me. But so my role as a head coach, what I've, what I've typically done uh, – I think it's important to always be the lead recruiter and the promoter of your football program as the head coach. Uh, you're the guy in the hallway. You're the guy that the kids see. Um, you're the guy on social media that, uh, that everyone's looking after or looking at. So you got to be a good lead recruiter and you got to be a great promoter of your own program and marketing the brand. Uh, the second thing is you're a problem solver. Again, the, the buck stops with you. Um, you are the liaison between the parents and what's going on. And then you're the liaison between the school officials and the teachers and what's going on too. So uh, I think um, 
you know, that, that's one thing that's worked out well over time is that the kids know that when they get into trouble, they come to me or they're going to have to at least talk to me at some point in time. So there's no uh, confusion about what's going on there. The other roles that I have that I think have been important, uh, offensive coordinator, special teams coordinator, and as an individual position coach, I coach the QBs. So um, why, real quick, I think it's important to be able to ask to answer why with all these things. But in my opinion, so these roles specifically, uh, it's important to come from the top, and I think it's naturally emphasized this way. Uh, there's no gray area with uh, you know parent concerns or playing time, um, and if there is and uh, someone else on staff is trying to answer those questions about playing time, I think it's important to nip it in the bud right away because, again, I think if there's one voice, uh, it's stronger. But it pairs nicely with the offense that we run and the system that we have to make sure that I'm the position coach for the quarterback. Again, our quarterback must do a lot, and we rely on him a ton uh, to do things the right way. So it's important that I'm working with him all the time, I think. So I want to talk a little bit more about those roles and, again, this is just a matter of uh, a preference and, and what I think has worked really well over the years. Um, but again, just to define what exactly I'm talking about, um, I think it's important for the head coach to be the offensive coordinator because the buck stops with me. Uh, naturally, everyone has better ideas, and uh, I think it's okay that just let them all be mad at one person, uh, including your staff sometimes. You know, if it's a tough fourth down call and it's fourth and three and, and you know, you're not the head coach. That's a, you're not the offense coordinator as a head coach. Well, that's a tough, uh, tough thing to decide and a tough thing maybe to, to, uh, to come to grips with after the game. But if the buck stops with you and you're calling that, that play and you're making that decision on fourth and three, I think everyone can, can live with it. Um, as long as there's one voice. So I th again, I think that's one point that's worked well, special teams coordinator. I think it's important to try to take the lead as much as possible with preparation and practice. Um, with special teams, you know, I'm visible at practice. It's not an afterthought and it's valued that way. So uh, when we have punt team, uh, we typically have like emergency siren that signals punt team, but I'm the one calling out punt team. Uh, we're, we, we get the period going, but again, I'm the facilitator with, uh, with when punt team happens um, to think of the opposite. I don't do, I just don't we'll walk off the field into the field house when, when punt teams there, special teams is called because I'm bored. So I think it's important to value it, and that's that's a way that we make sure that special teams are valued. And then QB's individual position coach. And I think just the position itself is an extension of me. Um, you know, everybody's a great quarterback, and everybody scrutinizes the quarterback. So, again, I think it's important, again, to be where the buck stops with the quarterback play. So um, if I can kind of sum up what I'm, what I'm saying there is, again, in general, I think the three biggest roles in the game of football as we see them right now, again, for the most part, uh, the ones that are scrutinized the most are the, the most are the head coach, the play caller, and the quarterback. So, I think it's on me to allow myself to be the most scrutinized person before anybody else on the staff or the team. So, again, that's a way to maybe protect your players and uh, protect your staff members. Again, last thing is, in addition, I think it's also important to me that I set the example and be the example. So, uh, I'm an individual position coach like everyone else. So, um, each day in practice, we have a f mandatory 40 minutes of individual for both sides. And I'm not walking around. I'm, I'm right there uh, getting my hands dirty with the quarterbacks for 40 minutes, and, and we're doing quarterback individual. Again, trying to create a level playing field for everybody, and that I'm one of the guys as well. So, um, And, again, the other thing about special teams is we always value special teams because they're built into our practice. So we're not having them at the beginning and getting them done. We're not having them at the end and just it's an afterthought. They're built into practice. And, again, we're valuing it because I'm there as the head coach. As funny, a quick story in our playoff game last year, we had our punt blocked and we had some bad snaps and, uh, you know, that was on me and that was tough because, uh, I think it was our first punt blocked all season and it was at a terrible time resulted in a safety, but, um, you know, I could go to bed at night knowing that, uh, that, that the punt team and the snaps and whatnot were on me as opposed to leaving it up to chance for somebody else. A couple more things about making special teams a priority. Okay, so every day in practice, we have pre-practice. We're basically special teams individual. So uh, what pre-practice is, is it, just as it sounds, it's it's before really practice begins. It uh, It's a chance for us to get out there with kickers, snappers, punt returners, kick returners, uh, long snappers, short snappers, all together, and everyone goes somewhere. 
But again, we divide the field up. We divide the coaches up. Everyone has a, has a place to be during pre-practice. And we all do special teams individual at that time. So all coaches are involved. All players are involved. Special teams is emphasized. It's the way we start every practice. Uh, there are different lead coaches for special teams, but again, they're all funneled to me. So our defensive coordinator typically takes the lead of punt return because it's a more or less a defensive play. But again, that's funneled towards me. I'll set up the drill. We'll set up the time frame, and then the defense coordinator will take the lead on what's going on. But again, all decisions uh, will end up being funneled to me. Special team segments built into practice. Again, uh, we'll typically um, start off practice with with pre practice, like we said. After individual, we'll probably have another segment. After a team, we'll have another segment, and we'll usually end practice with one more special team segment. Again, it's not thrown all the way at the end. It's not built into the beginning, and then, then it's done. We try to pepper them throughout practice to make them emphasize. And then we typically sound the sudden change alarm, making it as game-like as possible. But again, thinking about special teams as a whole, trying to make it game-like, trying to make it, uh, trying to make it matter to the guys. And um, one last thing I'll say, special teams depth chart, the ever-changing document, um, talking about staff and, and really relying on people to do things. Um, not everybody wants to mess with the special teams depth chart, but what an essential piece. And you really need someone on staff that you trust a ton because it's always changing. But we try to always have a special teams depth chart that is up, that is posted and constantly updated and then uh, taken to the game, obviously, too. But um, our guy on staff, Coach Leach, does a great job with that. Coach Dole's done a great job with that, making sure he laminated copies of all the special teams depth chart in case an injury always happens. So, um, again, multiple ways to make sure special teams is a priority. And one final thing I'll say about special teams. We do uh, so when we do our, our depth chart on game days. Uh, typically, the last thing we do after we eat team meal, we will go over our special teams depth chart and we will clap off on all the substitutions. So, again, one more way and one more big thing to prioritize and make sure special teams is a big deal and not an afterthought because it may not win you a bunch of games, but it certainly can lose them. Uh, the last piece of this is, is just making sure defense is a priority. Uh, naturally, with, with my discussion uh, as, as the role of the head coach, it will make offense valued, right? So if the head coach is the, the play caller and he's, he's, he's messing with the quarterbacks all the time, obviously offense is a big deal. So I got to do everything I can to make sure that defense is even bigger of a deal. So many times uh, my team will not see me at the other end of the football field on the defensive side because – I'm with offense, I'm with off offensive individual or, uh, you know, with offensive drills. So there's got to be some ways that we can make defense a big deal uh, we, without without sacrificing the other stuff that I've mentioned. So how do we make sure defense is a big deal? We're not going to outscore people. We want to make sure that we're stopping people and uh, really putting a lot of onus on playing great defense. So the biggest thing is you got to really own up to making a big deal all the time. Uh, number one, we got to hire great coaches on defense. Um, they're basically a staff within themselves. They've got, um, you know, right now we've got a, a defense coordinator that oversees everything that really specializes in the back end. We got a guy that's uh, more of a fronts guy uh, that that sees uh, the the box, if you will. And then we've got a, another corners coach. We've got an inside backers coach. We've got a D line coach, and we've got an assistant D line coach. So um, altogether, there are more defensive coaches than offensive coaches. So every player will have their own individual coach and own individual time if you're playing Hamilton defense. The other thing is all kids will always learn the defensive position, um, except for the starting quarterback. And there's been times where uh, we've gotten to uh, uh, arguments about that, but every kid always learns a defensive position every time. And then our defensive coaches have their own staff room uh, as well. So again, trying to make sure uh, the defense is its own entity and it's its own team within a team, if you will. And uh, they're always uh, they're always working hard. A couple other things that we do to make defense a priority. Uh, every team meeting will start usually with announcements from me. Then we'll go straight to defense. Uh, we, we won't mess with offense. We'll talk about defense first, make it a big deal. Defense always gets uh, those 40 minutes of individual time daily. We try to be as two platoon as much as we can. And I know that's hard at some schools, but 
again, I think it's very important to make sure that defense is always getting individual time. It's always important to practice tackling, turnovers, um, all that individual stuff that's going to show up in the game. And if you don't, it's not emphasized. It's a lot easier to practice plays and rep plays. But if you're not putting a notice on defense, it's going to be hard to stop people um, most effectively. The one thing that we do, um, I got this from a, a friend of mine that was uh, was coaching at Michigan, but uh, we have a defensive clap session. It is the last thing that we do before we take the field every Friday night. So we only announce the defensive starters before the game. So we will do this in the locker room by ourselves. That's the last thing we do before the team takes the field. We go through and we announce every uh, uh, every every defensive starter, all 11 of those guys, and we clap off to the snap count. But we turn the lights out, make it a big deal. Again, offensive guys get recognized enough, right? But uh, defense, we make it a big deal to be a starter on defense. You are the last group of guys recognized, and each individual position coach uh, gets excited and shouts the name of their guys as the last thing we do before we go out defensive clap session. So anybody that's been able to be a part of that at, at Hamilton or a couple other places that we've been, uh, I think they get excited about that. One of my favorite things. So defensive clap session, and again, making sure that we emphasize uh, defense at all times. So I'll take a little pause for a second uh, and regroup. And I want to talk a little bit about some simple offensive run game concepts that I think have worked uh, uh, the last three stops. And, and again, uh, three offensive uh, concepts that, that help us you know, run the ball effectively and use our athletes in space. All right. Part, part two, what I want to talk about um, gets me a little bit more excited, but uh, again, the, uh, the, the program stuff is, is extremely important. I think it's uh it's worked well and um again and probably more important as we all know than the scheme but um uh, talk a little bit more about our scheme that we've done over the last couple of years that have 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 helped on offense so so part two simple offensive run game concepts that we've used so our plan we're just using simple blocking schemes to get the ball in the hands of our athletes right uh we like to use double reads they can be triple option plays but typically they're more double reads with the quarterback and the running back are, are typically the double read. Um, there's times where we've been really good throwing the, throwing the ball where you can make that an option. You can use that as a, a pre-snap RPO. But again, at the heart of it all, we're using a double read and trying to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, again, our plan, just keeping it simple. Uh, one, one thing that I've stumbled upon that I've used for a long time now, we do not use the word right in our offensive system. So, I'll say that again. We do not use the word right. Uh, it is understood that the play direction and formation is always to the right unless you hear left or load. So this eliminates a lot of unneeded verbiage um, that you just simply don't need. So, again, our kids know that if you hear trips, it's not right trips. It's just trips. Um, if you hear power right, doesn't exist. It's just power. Okay. If you hear power load, power is going to the left. Right, if you hear, um, you know, uh, left trips, trips is to the left. Okay, so we do emphasize um, left as play direction with the word load. So again, if you hear left, um, it is the formation. If you hear load, it's the play direction to the left. That just prevents us from saying left too many times. But again, we're cutting out the word right. It's understood that everything's to the right unless you hear left or load. All right been using it for 10 years. It's a great way to use things uh, in, a, in a simple manner. In addition, we try very hard to make sure that the language of the offense and the defense are the same. So any chance you get the label formations and plays the same, if the defense is calling something, um, you know, uh, power, offense should call it that. Uh, if the defense is calling a uh, formation red or blue, it'd be nice if the offense used it as red or blue. Uh, if you're calling something, again, doubles, Call it doubles on, on defense. Don't call it ace. Uh, it just makes it easy and simplifies everything for everyone. So some of the simple offensive concepts I'm going to talk about, they are uh, a play called a, a popka, which is your traditional power read. Uh, piston, which is a version of power read. Counter and counter tray off of them and some quarterback variations to go with them. So I'm going to show you some game clips. We'll talk through some talk through some things you'll see everything that i'm talking about but again uh trying to find ways to use double reads or double options um for your quarterback and running back a great one that i've loved for a long time is again is, is your power read 
uh, it pairs great with uh, running power um, and again some counter some counter tray off of it and we call it Apopka because I got it from uh, Coach Darlington down there in Apopka, Florida. So uh, we've used it. We've called it that ever since, and it's been a good play for us for a while. So I'm going to bounce over to Huddle and uh, talk you through some of these game clips. Coach you up through these as we go here. Um, before I do, again, those are, these are going to go uh, in order. I'm going to try to build off of these. But uh, you'll see a little bit of the naming up here, what I'm talking about. But, again, if you hear in our offense, if you hear left trips, okay, uh, that is what you see, all right, trips to the left. The play direction, all right, it's understood that it's to the right. So whatever play this would be, you don't see any tag, you don't see load. So the play is going to the right. And I know it's kind of weird to get used to, but, again, it cuts down half of the verbiage right away. So, again, trying to simplify things for your guys as much as possible. As I talk through Apopka, again, think power read, all right, and I'll help you block it here in a second. But, uh Again, so the biggest difference between power and power read is simply that. So power, you're kicking out typically the end man on the line of scrimmage. If you're going to read power, we are going to do just that. Instead of kicking the guy, we are going to read him, right, which presents a double option then essentially. So um, as we go through this, think about that. So to sort of start out with a hard one, uh, we have a stack team with an adjuster. Um, so we felt like because they are stacked in and they left a vacancy out here, we felt that we could run power read or basically an outside stretch play with power uh, to the boundary. So that was our thought process. And again, this running back, as he runs, he's going to try to use, lose a yard and get around the edge. As he does that, the quarterback's going to shuffle twice and read the end man. Okay, and it does get a little dicey with the stack. So what we told these guys for this particular game, we told them it's going to be a give, 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 just unless you feel heavy, heavy outside pressure. Okay, and then you could pull keep. Other than that, offensive line, we are trying to build a wall here. He's going to be hunting down this mic. Right? We are hammering down hard inside. We're working back here. We are going to pull around, and he should insert – Right. He should not chase. He does chase in this example, but he should pull around much like a power pull. However you want to coach, don't overcoach it. If you got to overcoach it, probably shouldn't pull with that guy. And then we're going to step uh, and secure that backside cutoff gap here, and then he can hinge, hinge around. But um, we really like a two-step shuffle cutoff as opposed to necessarily a step hinge. Um, at any rate, that's our, that's our power replay. We call it a pop gun. We'll take a look at it. So, again, first thing I see is, um, you know, the kids aren't always right, but he should pull up in here, right? There's no need to chase this guy. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, and this was part of our game plan, we felt like – we really felt like these guys were going to spill, so we were just going to go around it. And, again, there's really no support player in the alley, so we liked our chances of getting to the alley before, uh, before, they, before they could pull us up, and that's what happened here. Outside receiver did a nice job of just running off and, and blocking eventually. So power scheme, but we're reading the kick out as opposed to kicking him out. He becomes a read. Look at the end zone copy. Now you can start to see if this guy were to pop out with the outside run play by the back, that's where that keep comes alive and you'll see some more in a little bit so again play number one we're talking about pulling the guard locking everything down pulling the guard and then we're reading the front side in man same play we're running again power read into the boundary reason being again that there's not a whole lot of support here we're going to read the end man. All right. It's a give, 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 unless, and he felt some pressure there, so he is allowed to keep it. And again, just being an athlete in space, we'll watch the tight copy. Okay, he's going to ride. He's going to get, he's going to shuffle two steps and decide as this guy pops out. 
There's your wall built. There's your scene. Good stuff. Just athletes in space. All right. So this is um, just so uh, just so I make sure I illustrate that we've done this a couple of years in a row at a couple of different teams. This is at Northwest. Same type of deal. So we have uh, left trips, as you can see. But we're going to throw a wrinkle into this one. <clears throat> we are actually going to rob or motion flat across. All right. Left trips, we're going to motion flat across and then run power read a popka again. Okay. Our guys know that when Rob or Lou is tagged, this guy here in motion is now the back. And the running back, he will align play specific to execute the play. So he becomes a lead back now. Okay. And then it's the quarterback's job to time this up with the jet guy. You'll see here. So there comes the Rob motion left trips, Rob across. Quarterback's going to snap it in time to allow him to shuffle, shuffle. We got a good cutoff. We got a guard pulling. He's going to insert. All right. Right now, the lead backs on the alley defender. Here's our read. He's popping out with the jet, as so often they do, and they see a hard jet across, and hopefully the quarterback keeps it. There he goes. This quarterback did a really, really good job of, of ball deception. He did a really, really good job. He shuffled twice, almost two and a half times, and waits to the last second to pull that sucker. Uh, tall kid, not super fast, but really, really good at uh, ball deception and riding and deciding. You can see the guard pull around, and he doesn't even have anybody to block, but his eyes go inside. So, again, you saw early on film, the last guy didn't do a great job of it. He pulled around and his eyes were outside and he was chasing. When the guard pulls around, power read. If there's nothing there, look inside. <clears throat> look back inside. And when your guard's blocking the safety, you got a good play. All right. I'll add to a little bit of a, a wrinkle here, but again, we're going to go uh, power read to the left. That's the load tag. So again, uh, you got trips. And if you hear left trips, that's all formationally based. If you hear load, that is play direction based. So trips to the right, uh, trips, 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 Lou flat motion to the left, power read load or power read left. All right, so <clears throat> right away, excuse me, uh, the offset back knows that he's becoming the lead blocker, okay? We should be reading him, working to set a wall inside, all right, and then we are pulling around. Quarterback's job to time it up. Does a great job of timing it up. Very good. We got our alley defender blocked. We got our read. We got a nice wall built here. We're going to pull around for the first thing that we see. It's funny, the left tackle actually exchanges jobs, but this guy crosses his face. He actually works towards him. Uh, but typically, he should be working back, but this guy's playing about seven yards deep, which you shouldn't be doing. So they exchange responsibilities, but nonetheless, you get the idea. The read chases the jet, and it becomes a nice pull keep. Okay. Trips, uh, power read, load. And so this picture gets a little muddied. The nice thing is, and again, the fun thing is about these double reads is that you're playing a little bit of backyard football sometimes. All right, so this is our read. You know, this is our read here. If he pops out and plays the jet, the quarterback should keep it. Uh, but again, try not to overcoach it. Um, there's really no alley defender here. So he kind of swallows him up. And then talking with the quarterback afterwards, he felt that he saw him block. He felt that he had a bunch of space, so he just gave it, and it turned out to be a good result. Again, a, a great way to uh, horizontally stretch the defense. But then again, if the quarterback keeps it, you got a nice vertical puncture as well. So, All right. Moving on to a different team and a little bit of a different play, same concept. So we are running a version of power read, but <clears throat> we're going to label this as piston. So what we, what we do, we do run a downhill uh, inside belly scheme too. 
So we are going to block our inside belly scheme, but run power read. So you're really thinking about a, a, a true inverted veer situation. So we're going to block this all back one way, but attack downhill right now. And we're not going to we're not going to zone it. We're attacking downhill right now and trying to block it block it back one way or the other. We're going to read the end man on the line of scrimmage. Same rules apply. The quarterback's going to read that thing. He's going to shuffle twice, and then he's going to replace, or he could give the jet or give the long handoff around. Okay. So we actually put Trip's wing uh, into the boundary here, and we are going to run Piston out of the backfield. Okay, so he's going to shuffle across in a situation like that. And again, um, against this front, we didn't want to pull anybody, so we're just going to block it all back. Here's our read. Our read is the end man on line of scrimmage. The wing will take care of the alley defender, and we're going to rip wall here, and we're going to work everything else back. Okay, and you'll see a good horizontal and vertical stretch here between the read and the alley. So quarterback's going to shuffle twice and decide. Shuffle twice and decide. <clears throat> right here, here's our read. Right. Quarterback felt like he's playing that a little bit too much. We got a nice rip wall. We got a hat on a hat, and there's your wall built, and there's a seam in there. So when the quarterback keeps this sucker, he's gone. And you got the quarterback running on on the safety. That's a good play. Safety whiffs, and it's a touchdown. So, again, not pulling a guard this time, just blocking it all back. <clears throat> uh, this is from last year here. Same idea. And, again, going off of the concepts that we just talked about, we're on left trips. We're going to rob across and now run piston this way. So here's our lead back, block an alley defender. No pulling guard this time. Here's our read. We're going to block everything back, all right? And the quarterback's going to read, ride and decide off the end man. Clearly, that's a keep. Right, he is attacking the jet, which helps us define, and the quarterback's going to keep that thing in there. Here's a good look at it from the tight. Again, left trips, we're going to rob flat motion across, and we're going to run power read, blocking it without a pulling guard. Here's our read. Lead back should take the alley defender. All right, and we're just blocking it all back in here. Uh, the nice thing is there's a very aggressive defense. As you can see, a lot of guys turning and running, turning and running, turning and running, and that creates a nice seam for that quarterback to tuck back inside, especially since we got a nice cutoff here, and that's a big hole. Okay, different game. Uh, this time we're going to be in a doubles two-by-two two formation with a wing, okay, and we're going to rob across <clears throat> and again, same play. Right, so double swing, a little bit of window dressing here, different formation, even different personnel, same play. Right, this is against a pretty good cold rain defense here. So again, as that as that motion comes across, right, here's our read. Blocking the alley defender. We're going to rip wall, get the backers and double back. Right. Now we can get two guys on the edge. Quarterback does a great job deciding to keep it. Again, shuffle twice. He overplays the jet. There we go. Now, the more willing the quarterback is to keep it and hit it hard, the greater it makes the play. So two shuffles. Got a lot of over-pursuit. You got a wall built back here. There's your vertical seam. It's as good as it gets. And again, that's probably one of the best defenses in the state of Ohio year in and year out. We'll take it. One more time, we're going to look at uh, a give. Okay. So double swing. 
He's going to rob across. We're going to run piston. The blocking it all back. No pulling guard. The read kind of sits inside a little bit, so quarterback decides to give it. Now, the running back is a special kid. Uh, he does a great job of, again, losing a yard to gain ground, okay, and allow these edge blocks to happen. Just turns into a sweep. Get a hat on a hat, letting the running back go to work. So one more time, same play. Quarterback's going to decide. He's sitting inside a little bit. You got two hats out in front. He gives it, turns into a long sweep. And really the guys in front did a great job of getting a hat on a hat. From the tight. So you get a, a defense that's slanting angles a little bit. You can kind of dictate where it's going. But you know, if they're slanting this way with the motion, uh, that's great and all. But if he really doesn't decide on taking this away, you can still give it and get around it. And if he does declare and take it away, there comes your keep too. So that's kind of a muddy picture, and it works out both ways for us. And that's the, that's the, uh, that's the idea of the play. Again, you're getting some horizontal stretches uh, to puncture the defense vertically. And sometimes even when you decide the wrong thing, it works out pretty well. So, again, it's a little bit of backyard football sometimes, but when you're letting your kids go play, uh, it works out pretty nicely. And you don't have to call the greatest play in the world every time. Different play here. Uh, we are in a uh, split, nasty formation. So these guys are tucked down a little bit. Um, different formation, same play. Two backs in the backfield. Again, same rules apply. If we're running piston uh, or power read that way, the front back will block support. So we messed with a little bit of the blocking rules. We'll down these guys a little bit and arc him around. Same idea, though. So in this particular example, uh, this guy should be our read, but he kind of swallows up the receiver. So the quarterback's in the same role. There's a little bit of gray area there. He's going to give, 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 unless he just gets a, th a great threat outside. And he didn't get that threat. We blocked him up, so he gave the ball. I really like how he carried out his fake here. And we get out and around it. And just turns into a long sweep. From the tight copy. Okay, again, a different version of the same play. We're going to go doubles now. We're in a true two by two open formation. We're going to rob across, right? Doubles rob. And again, we're going to block it all back and block piston. So we're going to rip underneath the hem, block this all back. And again, run power read out here. He's blocking support. There you go. Should be a give. He squeezes down to spill it. We got a blocker on the edge. And we got a runner on the edge. That's a pretty good job by their defense by setting an edge and forcing it back inside. However, again, good athlete with the ball. Does a little bit of a does his football moving and takes care of business. I'm trying to rip ball here. Working back. Here's our read. Comes down to spill. Should be a give, and we're out and around it. And again, should end up picking this guy up. And we do not, and we still get five yards. Okay. Another look at it again without using the jet, just playing it out of the backfield. So we got a left trip swing formation here. Uh, piston load. So we'll run it to our left. The wing is going to arc for alley. We're going to rip wall, get a hat on the hat all the way back. <clears throat> Here's our read, and we'll see what happens. We give it out around it this time. Right, it turns into a long handoff. 
and the back does a really good job here. Uh, as he comes across, he loses a yard to gain. And even really not even a great clear picture, but because the running back loses a yard, right? This guy who ends up getting blocked as the read can't turn around and make the play. We're out and around it. All right. Uh, I got a couple of wrinkles that I want to share with you off of that, that flat action, whether it's uh, whether it's out of the backfield and you're going flat across one or the other, or if it's a, a Rob or Lou jet sweep type action where it's happening a little faster. But either one, you can do both of these plays. Uh, they are quarterback-centered runs. Um, so we're going to call it a Q counter and a Q tray off of both of these. So, again, if you got a good flat action in the backfield, if you got whether it's out of the backfield or if you got a good, good flat action coming from a jet motion, uh, this is good to use either way. We will only run this one way. Sometimes we'll run it both. But, again, we found out that uh, just getting good at this counter play one way has been really good for us. So first one we'll show you is uh, doubles wing. We're going to rob across. Okay, so with doubles wing, we're going to rob to the top of the screen and cue counter. Counter tells us that we're only pulling two guys. We're going to kick one and clean through the other. All right, we've got another play where we'll pull more than that. Let's go ahead and look at the type. So here we are. We flash across with our rob motion. All right, and then the the right guard from right to left is going to kick the first thing he sees, and the wing from right to left is going to clean up anything he sees. And again, we get a heavy rotation back here. We get a heavy rotation down here with the with the jet motion, and then we're out the back door. And that's a pretty picture. Again, running on the safety. Just letting your athletes in space go to work. Here's another look at it. Same game later in the game. Again, doubles wing. We're going to rob across. Right. The nice thing here is that, you know, if, if the defenses, you can pick up where their eyes are. That lead back has always been the lead blocker for the alley defender and the power read stuff that we've shown you already. So now the same way, this looks a lot like power read or jet coming this way because that lead, that lead back takes off. But when we're going to pull kick here and we're going to pull clean with the wing. So if your eyes are on, on the back or in the backfield, you're probably taken off over top and it's done. Again, we'll get teams that'll rotate this way with Jet. And then so now we're coming back here with a Q counter. So we tell the quarterback to slide slide one time. So shuffle one time and get in the hip pocket of the second puller. Here he just bounces it and makes a play. But again, if you stop it right there, you got a lot of people running this way and committed to that side, and no one left inside this hash. Same type of deal. Robin across, Q counter. The nice thing is if we got so much rotation, again, they do a pretty good job. We don't do a great job of getting a kick out. We should get a clean right in there. And that thing should probably hit in that A or B gap. <clears throat> they do a good job of clogging this up. But again, at least in space, you're one on one with half of the field left. We like our chances. Uh, one more wrinkle here. I, I do want to show you a, a Q tray. Um, so if we get a team that we feel like is a, in a certain front that um, we won't block with an extra guy on the front side of this play, or if we really feel like these down guys are really playing hard, this jet or flat motion, or even out of the backfield, that action right there, we're just going to pull all three guys. So when we, uh, when we run quarterback tray, we are actually pulling – uh, three guys to the point of attack. We're going to pull the right guard, we're going to pull the right tackle, and we're going to pull the sniffer back all the way back the other way. We'll set up a wall going down this way, and then we'll wrap them all back in here. So um, here you go. So doubles wing, we're going to rob across, snap it, quarterback's going to slide, and then here they come. So we got three guys, we're going we're gonna to double kick. So they're going to kick anything they see, and then that sniffer will wrap back inside, eyes inside, and uh, there's no one left. So that's a great job there. I'll show you one more time. So again, flashing across, we're going to kick. We're going to double. I get double kick. There's no one left to kick. So he cleans up and he cleans up and now we're running.
There's another look at it, different time in the game, same play. So again, we're going to rob across. And again, we're thinking that this guy's going to take himself out of the play, and we don't think he's good enough to come inside and make the play. So we're going to pull everybody. One kick. Again, one clean. Here's another clean. All right, one more time for good measure here. So a different formation. Instead of a, a double swing, or instead of a trip swing, we're in double swing. We're going to rob across. Okay. And again, a lot of flow. This is earlier in the game. I'm sorry, this is later in the game, and they're still flowing. Guys flowing over the top, honoring that jet sweep motion here, coming here. Quarterback keeps it. We set up a nice wall, and we've got guys out in front. And again, even the safety is coming down here. There's no one left. Yeah, that quarterback was a dude who liked to run downhill. So great running downhill quarterback can take care of business with this. All right. So, uh, you know, to kind of sum up what we're talking about here, um, you know, really, uh, really like the, the double option stuff, keeping it simple. I, I think it's important that, uh, you know, if you've got a couple of guys and you can use these guys in space, use them in space, but keep it simple. Um, you know, the triple has been great for a long time, but uh, sometimes just just having some things as simple as a double read. Um, again, you know, with the power and the power read stuff, you've got a horizontal stretch, which turns into a sweep and you've got a puncture downhill play with the quarterback. And, and we can switch those things up. We can add a pre-snap and post-snap pass play off of it that, I'll talk about another time, but we got a lot of good stuff to really threaten the defense horizontally and, vor and vertically with two players, a running back and a quarterback. And if you got a wide receiver to boot, uh, you got a good situation with a pre snap or a post snap RPO to the backside off of the same stuff. So, again, uh, appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for listening. If uh, you got any questions, holler at me, let me know. I can help you out uh, any way I can. And, and uh, again, coach, coach for, uh, Banstra for having me on. Good stuff. So you guys have a good night. Thank you.